Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Craig Jinks, and I'm currently the director of the Manawal Indigenous Higher Education Centre here at the University of Canberra. I'd first of all like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the Manawal people and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge all the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in the room tonight. Chancellor Dr. Tom Kalman, Acting Vice Chancellor Professor Francis Shannon, Rochelle Tower, who is our guest speaker tonight, distinguished guests, University of Canberra Council members, staff, students, and alumni. Welcome to the University of Canberra's first Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal Lecture for 2015. The Ngunnawal Lecture Series originated as an initiative of the Ngunnawal Centre at the University of Canberra to give voice to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander views on the many topics that shape their communities and Australia as a whole. The Ngunnawal Lectures continue to do this by hosting prominent Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people to deliver lectures on issues of significance. Lectures and events such as these are important ways that the university can communicate and share knowledge with the wider community, which can impact on the quality of our graduates and future government policies. Unfortunately, our Ngunnawal elder couldn't be here tonight, so um, I won't be able to do a welcome in the country, but I do acknowledge that we are with, um, meeting and, and meeting on Ngunnawal land tonight. First of all, I'd like to introduce our, our Chancellor, Dr. Tom Kalman, who was well respected for his inspirational and inclusive advocacy for human rights and social justice. And he's dedicated his life to improving the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in particular. I've had the privilege of working with Tom over a number of years, and um, I'm very proud that he's, uh, he's one of, he's the first male Aboriginal counsellor Chancellor of an Australian University, sorry Tom. And I've worked with Tom over a lot of years, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tom to um, say a few words. Thank you, Greg, and um, Professor Francis Shannon, Acting Vice Chancellor, um, Amanda Sharma, who's a member of the, the, the Council and uh, head of the Academic Board, faculty, uh, students, uh, staff, alumni, and Rochelle, of course, uh, who's here and staff of uh, the AIRC. Can I also acknowledge that we're on the land of the Ngunnawal people and recognise their elders past and present and, and also their youth who are going to be our future leaders, the custodians of our story, our culture, um, our languages, and uh, it's important to recognise our youth. And it's good to see quite a number of young people. Um, great Duke's excluded from that um, <laughs> uh, here tonight. So it's, uh, no, it's, it's good um, to be here. Uh, I think it's also important to, um, to recognise the passing of, of a, um, a very important person in the Northern Territory, but also in the Australian landscape, um, uh, known as uh, Kung Jay Randall, uh, who's spoken here um, you know, at, at the university uh, in the past. But he's renowned for, for working on a whole range of issues uh, from the, the laws, um, uh, the legal aid service, which uh, I was chair when he was a field officer there in Darwin many, many years ago. President, I think we call ourselves that in those days, in the early 70s. And, um, but also wrote the, the song, um, Brown Skin and Baby, uh, which uh, you recall, which is really a, a tribute to, to um, the stolen generation. And, um, and a very good film called um, Kinyara, I think it was, um, that, that I really urge you to have a look at if you want to find out a bit more about the plight of Aboriginal people many, many years ago. Tonight we're going to um, hear from a most impressive lady about leadership and governance. And, and I, I thought, you know, what, what would I say about, um, about Rochelle and, and, the, and the topic, but felt that I might cut across a lot of what she wants to cover in, in her speech, uh, which is going to be important. But I wanted to say a few things. I've been on the Australian Indigenous Leadership Centre board since 2009 and, and uh, did a step for a few years as the uh, chair and then um, stepped aside, I think it was last year, to, to do what I really uh, urge other people to do and that is to create opportunities for younger people to go on to 
to boards and take on responsible roles and so forth. And so um, we were very proud to see that uh, a guy called Charles Prouse, who was an alumnus of, of the AILC, to come up and, and to be chair. So he's the, the first, I think, the first chair of AILC, um, who is also an alumnus. Uh, so it's a uh, you know, great honour. And I urge others to think about creating those opportunities. So the Australian Indigenous Leadership Centre, um, it's been around for probably about 14 years now. Uh, started off by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, two Aboriginal men, uh, in fact, and, uh, uh, and it's grown over the years to one where we deliver programs across the nation, and Michelle will talk about that. But uh, what we're very proud of is that we are a, uh, a registered training organisation. We're the only organisation in Australia that offers accredited uh, leadership training for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership training. And, um, and we, we um, get funded. It's only been in recent years that we've been able to, to get recurrent funding or at least multi-year funding. Uh, otherwise, we like everybody else, you know, cap in hand every year, not knowing whether you're going to exist or not. But we're now, uh, we own all of our courses. Um, the majority of our trainers are ex-alumni. And, uh, and so, you know, we're, we're doing what we want to, we promote, and that is to create opportunities for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership. And, uh, and in more recent years, we've moved into governance, which is also important. But as Michelle will t tell you, it's, uh, and she'll go through some of the stats, so I won't, um, won't cut her out of that sort of joy, but um, you know, on, on how the progression from people in, in the leadership course go on to, on to higher education. And, and uh, for us, it's, uh, it's really looking at the whole of life education um, that we're providing, but also creating the opportunity for uh, everyday Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to start off at a vocational level um, and go on to, to higher education. And will you talk about some of our alumni? You know, you, you'll be surprised when you hear about who some of our, our graduates have been and what they currently do um, around. I should refer to my notes at some stage. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, uh, just just about Rochelle. Uh, she's a proud uh, one Narara, uh, eh? Wanarua uh, woman, and um, she's been the CEO of the Australian Indigenous Leadership Centre since November 2007. And she'll talk about, um, I hope, uh, you know, being the accidental chairperson or the accidental CEO. And uh, you know you get thrown in the deep end, and you either sink or, or swim. And she not only swam, she outlapped everybody else. Um, she's played a very pivotal role in raising awareness about um, not only the the AIRC, but about the need for leadership and governance, and and to create the environment where everybody uh, knows that they can feel safe and secure in doing our courses and progress. It's not a cheap option. It's not an easy option for people. You still because we are an, uh, an RTO, we have to have a critical training and uh, and get assessed on it. So, so we make sure that that, that happens. Um, and, and and Rochelle, I'm sure, will talk about that. Um, and and about her journey, I think, is just absolutely fantastic. She's been recognised and continually is recognised. And and you know, um, I was supposed to deliver this speech, but she wanted to do it. So, <laughs> nah, that's that's a joke. Uh, I asked her. I wasn't going to be here, so uh, uh, so she was weak about that. So, uh, but uh, she also uh, was named the Emerging Leader of the Year for the not-for-profit sector in 2014, um, the National Australia Bank's Women's Agenda Leadership Award, uh, which is great, and in the same year won the Norm Fisher Award for uh, an outstanding and extensive contribution as an individual to vocational education and training in the ACT. And you may have not recognised it, but um, if you happen to be a Westpac customer and you went to the ATM, what you saw was Rochelle. She was the, the, the pin-up girl for the Westpac ATMs for, for the year or so. Um, uh, so you know, did, a, did a great job. And, uh, and that was just in recognition of all the work that she does. She comes from a very loving family and spends her time with her husband, um, her daughter, and her two dogs. And, not necessarily in that order, but <laughs> uh, my favourite. But uh, you know, she's a she's a great woman, someone I'm very proud of, 
and I think we'll all be uh, be uh, very um, uh, enlightened by what you have to share with us, Rochelle. Yeah, we'll talk about Dr. Tom and why, how I actually got here first, shall we? Yeah. Um, I actually thought that Tom um, wasn't available, so sometimes I get these gigs because he's not available. And um, when he rang me five minutes before we were just about to start, and I said, why are you doing here? He said, I'm coming to introduce you. And I went, but I thought I was here because you weren't here. And so anyway, I get lots of opportunities because Dr. Tom isn't available. But I too would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and thank them for allowing me to walk on this beautiful land we call Australia. I'm very honoured and privileged to be uh, a Wanneroo woman from uh, Singleton, New South Wales. And um, it's quite interesting over the last few days, or the last few months, um, with the Anzac centenary, my grandfather was, put his age up to go to war. He went to war at 14. And when he returned from war, he was put into a boys' home and a place called Minda, in, uh, just outside of Newcastle. And I now live in a street called Minda Place. So I know that my grandfather's spirit is, uh, walks alongside me. And Minda, in Aboriginal language, in Wanneroo country, means home. Sorry, I get a bit choked up about what I say, because it is so um, important that we have this thing called home. Because I haven't been home for the last nearly two and a half, three weeks. And I've got to say, when I do walk through the door, the ones that are really excited to see me are my two boys, Billy and Benji. They're the dogs. <laughs> but they are named uh, Benji Marshall and Billy Slater, so I'm quite a bit of a rugby league fan. <laughs> they have jerseys signed by their namesakes. But what I thought I would do tonight is to have, uh, I suppose, an open and honest conversation about me and how I've got to my role, um, because it has been quite an amazing journey. I was... Um, the eldest daughter of uh, four. My brother came last and he's still the spoilt person in the family, those of you who, are, who have that sort of makeup, uh, three girls and the spoilt boy. Um, but my parents, uh, we lived in Sydney, I was born in Blacktown. My parents uh, did, it, did it tough. My mum should have been a mathematician. Still to this day, in her 70s, she can say her times tables backwards, forwards and sideways. And she loves bingo and she can play like five cards upside down because that's, that's boring if you play them the right way up. But she could have been absolutely amazing and she still is. But um, growing up in that environment where uh, you, you left school, went and got a job and she worked in um, an industry uh, Silco, I'm pretty sure it was called, and uh, because that's what you did. There wasn't the extra stuff that, um, to go on to further education, etc. that she didn't think that she could do. But my father used to work six days a week on the railway lines, and from the railway line, from the city in the west, caught the train in and out of the city six days a week. And it wasn't until one day he realised that he didn't work on uh, Sundays, so he decided to pack us all up in the, in the car and we were going to Melbourne um, to, to move, to get a, have a new life. But we only had enough petrol to get to Canberra, so that's where we stayed. Um, and we're still here now, and this is when we're this big. But my father used to say that the only reason that we were moved, we moved to Canberra literally to become public servants. But we know the real thing, we only had enough money to get petrol to get to Canberra. Um, he was very proud of the three girls who had become public servants. Um, there was a little bit of a hiccup for me when I was in my middle teens in that I was this kid who thought that she ruled the world, as most teenagers do at 13, 14. So I decided that me and my cousin would run away from home and we went and lived in Sydney for probably about eight, nine weeks. And he and I both lived on the streets and we survived from couch serving. So while I had a, a bit of a, a stint, as I would call myself a street kid, I became very smart about what I could and what I couldn't do. The unfortunate st story of that is that my cousin who I was with, he couldn't, he loved the street life, he loved the excitement of it. And somebody gave him, as an Aboriginal young boy, um, a shot of heroin. And the unfortunate thing of that, he was a very talented rugby league player. He was the youngest person ever to be contracted with the New South Wales Rugby League. He was Captain Brad Fittler. 
So that's how good he was. Uh, he was on the front page and the back page of the, the paper that my father read on the train. And the unfortunate thing for him is that he wasn't able to escape that dependency of drugs. He lost his life uh, four years ago now to a combination of uh, both um, drug use and diabetes. And it's one of my big passions is that um, men's health and making sure that people, especially men, women do a lot in that space about looking after themselves. But when he died, I realised, and my father also died uh, around the same time, and my father was 61. And I looked at my, in the mirror and I thought, wow, I'm just the spitting image of my father. And he was a big guy. I was, at the time, 158 kilos, smoked like a chimney. So not only had I had the influence of my dad saying, you know, I don't want to be like that, Dad, I'm 41, you're 61, I want to be here a little bit longer than that. And uh, it was actually um, Uncle Tom that said to me, Rochelle, I can't be your chairman if you smoke, because, you know, I'm the commissioner for tackling indigenous smoking. And uh, so I went, oh, oh, Tom, chairman, Rochelle, smoking. I gave up the smokes because I knew that what we, do, what we did and could do together would, was really, really important. So I have had this accidental career, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Leadership Centre so you get a sense of why I have my passion for what I do and why I do it. Um, the, as Tom mentioned, the Australian Indigenous Leadership Centre was born on the idea of two guys, Joe Ross and Russ Taylor, who went on a rural leadership program and they came back thinking, why isn't there something like this for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? They got some money through the um, IATSIS, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. And the research report came back, yes, there's a need, yes, there's a want, um, but we want something more. If we're going to do training, we want to do training. We don't want to do training for the sake of training. We want a qualification from it. So hence we became an RTO. I think some days, and I, haven't, I don't know the university space, but I'm about to, um, it's a pain in the bum to be an RTO. Compliance, compliance, compliance. Dot, eyes, eyes to dot and T's to cross and then cross them over again and sing jingle bells as you do it. Um, so we started in 2001, we offered our first ever leadership certificate two level in Indigenous leadership. There was this big hype and hoo-ha about this program and we had doctors and lawyers and academics applying for a certificate two. And, but they'd already been to university, so why would they want to go backwards to go forwards? I didn't get that yet, but we'll come back to that. Um, we had some amazing people, like Natalie Walker, who is uh, also a board member of ours. Um, she was working in KPMG. She um, was CEO of Supply Nation. She now uh, runs her own business called Inside Policy. We had um, Mark McMillan, Professor Mark McMillan, at Melbourne of Univer Uni, Mel Uni Melbourne. Um, and many others that, that come along and did this certificate too. And for some of them, they say, hey, I've got, and this is from a quote from one of our board members, uh, Jason Mifsud, who works as probably one down from the CEO of a the AFL. And he goes, Rochelle, I've got three certificates in my life. I've got my birth certificate, I've got my marriage certificate, and I've got my certificate too in Indigenous leadership. These are the things that, you know, make it pretty pretty proud to be something, be of something. And I st when I started in 2004, uh, five, I didn't really get it at first. But when I see more and more people going through and seeing them from start to finish, I started to get addicted to this little drug called leadership training for me. Um, the, the certificate in Indigenous leadership means that uh, it's equal to a year 10 qualification. And for that, for some people, and I'll quote some statistics, in that a normal Certificate 2 program for us that brings people from around Australia to national program, um, for every 10 applications, we were only able to fill one. So very competitive process. So 25 start, 25 finish, 15 receiving their first ever educational qualification, 10 of them not reading or writing and having English as their third or fourth language. To know that empowerment of an individual, to see them walking in the room with their heads down, to seeing them participate in a graduation ceremony, that they're introducing the minister to come on stage and, and like it's 
something that they've always done. In knowing that uh, we were making some, some big roads in terms of giving people leadership development opportunities, and I should also state that just because we give a, a certificate in Indigenous leadership, does that make them an Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander leader? No, no, no. Um, it means that they're collecting tools and, and um, products within their toolkit to be able to use from time to time and to pull out. And sometimes you don't even know that you're using it. But KPMG did a, an impact assessment because while we were going along and tracking really well, our first ever money came from not Australia, because we couldn't get Australian money to get this thing off the ground, it came from the US. So the US Citibank gave us our first ever seed funding, which was so exciting. Are we thinking, hmm, there's a Liberal government, our chairman is uh, Professor Mick Dodson, not very well liked by Mr Howard at the time. Um, there was no way we will get money from, from the guys, so we went on a, please sir, can I have some more? And I use the analogy of scab duty. So in school you used to go around and say, can I have 10 cents, 10 cents my sausage roll, because I need some food. And um, th so the 10 cents now becomes 100,000 or 10,000, can I have some more? So it became very apparent that we knew that we were doing great stuff, but we didn't have the evidence to say, come along and on this ride. <laughs> we know we do great things. So from KPMG doing an impact assessment, we found out that our completion rates were above 95%. Unheard of. When Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people completing TAFE at the time at less than 16%. Ours were 95. We also know that 70% of our alumni going on to further education, either more vet sector training or more um, or into university training. And the great success about that is a local camp, or well, she's not a local local, but uh, a lady by the name of Stacey Anderson, youngest of 10 children from Rockhampton. None of her siblings had ever been to university. She did her certificate two in Indigenous leadership. She then went on to do a diploma of counselling. And last year, she graduated with honours with a social work degree. The amount of opportunity that has and the roll-on effect and the ripple effect that we're not just creating change with one, we change life with many. So our next challenge is to have a look at what is the social return on investment, you know, the new topics of the world, around if we are training 25 individuals in, say, Borroloola, um, how do we know that we are measuring change within Borroloola of 25 people graduating with either a certificate two in Indigenous leadership or maybe a certificate four in business governance. How do we know that we can measure that change? Because it's going to be more and more important that people aren't going to be wanting to invest their dollar that is becoming so, so much smaller uh, that you know, we can give evidence that is independent to make sure that we continue to do the job that we need to do. Um, so in that sense, we were doing these certificate programs from the CERT II. We then went in 2005, delivered our first certificate for an Indigenous leadership. Because we also knew the importance of the qualification in terms of being at the level where there was an opportunity for somebody to go on to a university to see if they could get recognised with our certificate for qualification. That was a hard vlog to get that up and running, but we did it and we now have that as one of the most highly successful programs that we have in our armoury. Two years ago we decided to go to the Office of Register of Indigenous Corporations because we were seeing that there were many, many people who were in positions of boards, on positions in, in boards. And I would go into a classroom of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and I'd go, how many of you are on boards? And everybody would go, yep, me. And keep your hand up if you're on more than one, two, three, four. They still had their hands up. I found 20. There was a guy there with, or he was sitting on 22 committees or boards. And he had no idea what director's liability insurance was. And I, my heart just went, oh my God, get off every one of them, get your name stuck off, struck off the company register and run. You're still going to be that's still going to be uh, with you all the time. But the importance of people not knowing governance. 
really just really surprised me. Because when I look around this beautiful country, I see that there is a lot of um, opportunity for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to um, be entrepreneurs, to be, um, to take money from mining royalties or native title, where there is a chance to turn that around and, and for good. Not a, I'm sit on the uh, Gumala Aboriginal Corporations Trust. Gumala Aboriginal Corporation is based in the Pilbara and it covers three language groups. Um, my job as part of uh, being their first ever East Coast independent director is to look after their money. They have over $100 million. They're the, they're the second largest Aboriginal corporation in Australia, uh, assumed to be number one. Number one is um, the Kimberley Lands, Kimberley Lands Council. And there is an opportunity for how do you, well, my job as a director is to work out how much money do we need for grandchildren's 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 grandchildren? Because there are still going to be effects from the land for generations to come. But there's also an opportunity to create things like funeral parlours where money's going out and how can we create an economic development piece of business that unfortunately one uh, was it three, three and a half, nearly three and a half people every week are buried within the Pilbara. So there is somebody there that's making money. And why couldn't it be Gumala as an Aboriginal corporation? Why couldn't the, the, the corner uh, takeaway store be an economic enterprise for somebody? And we have the money to be able to invest into making good corporations into better corporations. But it's important that we know what good governance is because the unfortunate thing that comes with wealth is that there's conflict. And conflict is one of the big tools of leadership that we have to teach. Um, this thing called lateral violence that unfortunately is, is, is spreading like wildfire and more and more so where there is money. And money is a necessary evil, the unfortunate thing. So I think the next thing for us to do is to take on some of that um, money training on when we got when I got my first job I was pumping petrol at Browley service station um, it's been knocked down since but um, you know nobody told me why I needed a bank account nobody told me why I needed and then down the track to have superannuation and a tax file number nobody explained all of those money management things for me but it wasn't until my auntie who at the beginning of the story was my cousin's um, mother. She was the one who said to me, Rochelle, we, we need to do the things a bit differently. And so I lived with her for um, over 12 months when I was, uh, got my first ever job. I worked in um, my first full-time job, I should say. I was pretty good at typing, so um, I went to business school and I got picked up because I could type and I could do shorthand. I used to watch Current Affair and do shorthand. Uh, and I got pretty good at it and I got my first job. And I, the, because I lived with her, she said, right, you're living with me, I'm going to give you $50 a week and that will be for your smokes. And that would be it. So every week we would have the same argument. Look at you, you're taking all my money, who do you think you are? Make me living off $50, which was a lot of money. Um, but it wasn't until 12 months later that on Christmas morning, she made me sit and unwrap the bank book that she'd saved every cent. And I felt like such an ass because every fortnight we would argue about money. But she taught me how to invest and she said, okay, what are you gonna do with this money and this bank book? I said, I'm gonna buy a car. She said, but you don't even have your license. Well, I thought that's what every, every teenager wanted was a car. Even if I didn't have my licence, it didn't stop me from driving a car. Um, but she said, oh, we, you know, we want to buy a house. And uh, so she didn't have the money. My uncle uh, was also uh, was an alcoholic, so um, money was very, very tight. So we went Harvey's and bought a house. And that house, um, I don't know whether you've seen the SBS show the other week in Mount Druitt, 
that's where our house was in the 2770 postcode. And I've seen this wonderful symbol on a t-shirt this week that my cousins all have their Facebook symbol of a, the Nike thing and it's got just drew it with the 2770 postcard. <laughs> I'm so getting that t-shirt printed uh, because um, she's still in that house today. Um, I was uh, 15 years ago still a, an owner in that house and 15 years ago um, I gave her the deed and said this is yours because I probably wouldn't be here today if you didn't help me and change my life. Um, because it has been the accidental CEO road for me. I was a public servant. I thought I was going to be a public servant forever. But then I found this thing called leadership and for me it's about giving people the opportunity to be the best that they can be. In a funny sort of way, I've had I, the accidental CEO, there will be a book. It has been written. It's um, sitting there waiting for me to sign it over to a publisher to say, please take this and be caring of it. Um, I see Matt um, in the room. He he's knows what I'm just about to say. I was given an opportunity, you know, big note up here on the stage, and I'm looking going, oh God. I get a bit nervous about heights because I do fall a lot. Um, I fell uh, in the NAIDOC celebrations last year while I was asked to go and lay a wreath at the, at the War Memorial. I fell into the flowers and every media outlet was there. <laughs> that was nice. I wanted to be a big noter and with big high heels on my skirt. And it wasn't pretty. Um, I also uh, wrote to Gail Kelly when she was the CEO of Westpac and said, Dear Auntie Gail, I'd like to have lunch with you and some of your rich friends. And she wrote back and said yes. Because there's only two areas in life that you can go, yes or no. So if you don't ask, you don't get. And she said yes, so I had to go and do this pre-arrangement thing for her. And well, yeah, she's on a secure floor of Westpac. So you go up to the 21st level and then you walk down to the 20th level because you can't get to there by the lift. And I'm reading the sign and it said, hold on to the rails. Again, I'm in my big NATO high heels, taking my big handbag out of one hand and put in the other. And I've gone, ka-dunk, not only did I break one arm, I broke, broke two arms. Um, and I didn't get to see Gail. They gave me the, <laughs> they gave me that whistle thing. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. <laughs> and um, so, you know, when you go into um, the hospital, I've never been to RPA, and you see RPA on the, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be on TV next to, just be my luck, still sucking on this green whistle. And, um, you know, you're filling in the form and they, first name, I'm like, Rochelle. And, you know, they ask you the identifier question, so I ticked, yes, I'm Aboriginal. And anyway, so got everything done and the nurse has walked in and she goes, oh yes, you've got two breaks, one in both arms, so we're going to have to put a half cast on you. And I said, you what? <laughs> what? I thought she was reading this form and going, are you, what are you saying here? And I got really quite agitated and she said, here, yeah, just suck back on the whistle. <laughs> so, um, yeah, some of the things that I've happened, I think that with, it's just, this is a chapter in my book, so I won't give it all away. But I've had, uh, for the women in the room, very embarrassing underwear stories. Um, uh, from my weight loss, I, uh, um, from giving up the smokes, I decided to walk because I needed another addiction, but I have an addictive personality. So I, I was 158 kilos. And we've got some new staff members, I was showing them these photos. This was me, like, like I wanted to do the pants thing. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I do have one pair of um, underwear, but they're not a thing that you bring out and show everybody. <laughs> but I do have them for special occasions, but they involve a little bit of red wine, I think. But having the, uh, the weight loss, and to be able to walk into a shop that's not the big girl shop was a really exciting thing for me to do. And I didn't know, so I went from 158 kilos and I'm now just under 90. And that's from, I tried knitting as my replacement for giving up smokes because I read a, a Women's Weekly thing that Julia Gillard was knitting. And I thought, well, I could try that. No, that didn't work. My scarf, who would wear that? <laughs> Terrible, cheaper to go down than to Woolies and buy a scarf. Um, and then I thought, oh, drugs, grog and gambling really aren't an option if I want to keep a job. <laughs> so I, I decided to walk. And the, the dogs love it. I love it. Um, now running. Um, I did, uh, I've done two 5k runs. Um, the knees aren't so good, but because I played netball as a kid, 
are still suffering from that. But to go from that to that and have, have um, to show people, I'm I was disappointed in myself that I allowed me to get that, that way. And I have to remind myself every day of, wow, you can do things that you weren't able to do before. You've got so much energy, so much more time to give. So not only do I um, have my life in terms of my work at the AILC and my board member stuff of Boomerla, I sit with Tom on, a, on with the Gandell Foundation Advisory Board. I'm on the Women's ACT Advisory, uh, Women's Advisory Committee, Ministerial Appointment. Um, but the most important thing that I do in my life is uh, I'm also a carer and guardian to my brother-in-law. And he turned 40 a few weeks ago. He's um, got cerebral palsy. He's both mentally and physically disabled. He's probably got the capacity of about a four-year-old. Uh, he's in wheelchair nappies and he, he, it's, it's a hard gig, but you know what? I wouldn't change my life for the world because we, I was saying before we started, some of the things, you know, a hundred things, if you think about a hundred things that you worry about, 99 things of the, out of those hundred don't actually come true. So there is this whole um, things that, voices in your head that keep going round and sort of keep questioning you all the time. Uh, and I was saying these things in my leadership uh, course, I was writing these things about, got to get off this island called Sunday. Well, time's up. Is that the end timer? <laughs> um, you know, we've got to start thinking about um, how we get to the next step. How do we do this thing called vision? With our alcohol management training that we're doing at the moment, it's like the vision is we want to be grog free by next month. Well, then how do we actually, what do we need to be able to get there to be grog free by next month? What sort of training do we need? The same could be said around being able to close, well, when we talk about the close the gap measures, we're not going, without good leadership, you're not going to be able to reduce the rate of childhood mortality. Without good leadership, you're not going to get kids to school. Without good leadership, you're not going to be able to do the things that make us better. So that's why it's so important for us to, to be here and to do the things that we do. The Sunday Island stuff, you know, I, I was, you know, like some of, some of you, you know, Monday morning, Uncle Tom got up and I bet you said, I'm going on that diet today. I'm going to do that exercise every day. Someday I'm going to look after myself or I'm going to go to the, the doctors, I'm going to go and get that blood test that I haven't done or I'm going to ring up my mum and I haven't spoken to some of my family members because I'm growly at them. Um, how do, you know, we've got to do this stuff. That, we've got to think about putting these things into action because, you know, life is so short, having, losing my dad when he was 61, to know that, you know, someday you'll be right that it is the last day and we've got to remember to forgive. Some of the things that we do in our own lives, it's really hard to forgive and the person, that it's really hard to forgive is sometimes yourself. And it, it does make this thing called leadership so important, that you've got to walk the talk. Um, and I haven't read anything on my paper, not one so ever. So I've got no idea, Uncle Tom asked me, did I uh, do a timing on this? So I've got no idea how long I have been speaking for and how long I've been drifting off and not going into my speech. But one thing I have remembered from writing this speech today is I read this book um, a few days ago and it was about uh, changing the song or changing the dance of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the connection with non-Indigenous Australians. And it only seems, well it's not long ago, it's 50 years or so ago that we were doing, we've been doing this dance around the connectivity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. And there's this dance that we've been doing, and we've not been doing it so well, there's been some toes stepped on, there's been some tunes or some missed beats, and I'm not gonna dance because I didn't know that I was gonna be on the stage, um, so I'm not even gonna try it because I will fall off, that's guaranteed. But think about, how do we change the dance? How do we change the beat? How do we change what hasn't worked into what could work? in making a, da a dance, whether it's, yeah, your dance could be the box trot. I remember when we were learning that in high school. Some, did you guys, the younger ones in the audience, did you could do ballroom dancing at school? Line dancing. Line dancing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But even that, you know, stepping on your partner's toes, 
Pride of Erin, that sort of rings a bell. Yeah, this one, did steps, yeah, okay. Um, but the dance around non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians and the connection between us hasn't been working. So I think we just need to have a new dance, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but having a look at what does the new beat look like. So that's me in a nutshell, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm too much of an open book. I so tell so much about my life to people. Even on the radio, I started talking about the underwear. I'm a shame. <laughs> shame. Thank <laughs> you.